Hello, I'm Kamal Santa Maria. This is Counting the Cost on Al Jazeera, your weekly look at the world of business and economics. This week, Ukraine, Russia, and the separatists. How did they get their hands on missiles capable of shooting passenger jets out of the sky? We look at the regional military arsenals and try to trace the paper trail. Also this week, payback. Former shareholders in UCOS, the defunct Russian oil giant, are awarded billions, but will Russia ever pay up? And half a world away, will Argentina pay the vulture funds waiting for their money at the same time as it teeters on the brink of default? Plus Sudan, a country with a golden history, but what cost could this modern day gold rush have? When planes crash, it is alarming. When they're shot out of the sky, it's another story altogether. And so we have found ourselves with the story of MH17 and the inevitable questions about who funded and armed the separatists who brought it down. There seems to be no doubt in Washington that Russia is behind it all. Even though Moscow denies that, the United States has pressed on, going down the path of economic sanctions. Today, and building on the measures we announced two weeks ago, the United States is imposing new sanctions in key sectors of the Russian economy. Energy, arms, and finance. We're blocking the exports of specific goods and technologies to the Russian energy sector. We're expanding our sanctions to more Russian banks and defense companies. And we're formally suspending credit that encourages exports to Russia and financing for economic development projects in Russia. As for the equipment, well, some was taken from Ukrainian bases. Some of the arms are said to have been mothballed in Russia. Why all the excess? Well, probably because upgrading equipment is big business. The Kremlin's spending as much as $720 billion between 2010 and 2020 on military upgrades. Just to break that down a little further, two years ago, 2012, that was how much Russia spent on its military upgrades, $90 billion on defence. By comparison, Ukraine, only $4.9 billion at the same time. What's interesting, though, is the way Russian hardware proliferates the region. The SA-17 Book II that's thought to have brought down the Malaysian passenger jet is common to both the Ukraine and Russian armies. Russia even sold eight battalions of books to Syria for a billion dollars. U.S. intelligence officials told the Financial Times Russia has supplied T-64 tanks, armored troop carriers and sophisticated anti-aircraft systems to the pro-Russian separatists in Ukraine. But Russia is also dependent on rockets, missiles, helicopter engines and Antonov aircraft, which are made in Ukraine. So you see, despite all the tensions, the countries and the region are all interlinked, certainly in a military sense. So let's trace the paper trail and see what's coming from where. We'll do that with Reid Foster. He is the head of Armed Forces Capabilities at the Defence and Security Analyst Group, IHS Jane's joining us from London. Look, Reid, the, the, the Americans are quite definitive. These weapons are coming from Russia, they say. I mean, can we be that definitive about this, do you think? Well, uh, considering that the Ukrainian and the Russian uh, inventories are, are so similar, it, it is difficult to be definitive on where this uh, uh, equipment was coming from. Uh, the manu they're manufactured in the same place uh, from the same factories. So with things like satellite imagery, it, it is challenging to discern one piece of equipment from another uh, when it is so similar. So then what would be the way moving forward? If you've got these two countries with similar hardware, plus you've got Russia upgrading its capabilities as well, um, where is this new stuff going to come from? Because, you know, the way the tensions are right now, you can't see them being quite so sharing and, and, and willing to manufacture things which are the same anymore. Certainly. Uh, I, the tensions that have uh, flared up in the last couple of months have certainly uh, damned in some way the relationship that uh, the Ukraine and Russia had traditionally shared as far as defense cooperation. Uh, there were significant... Uh, investments from the Russian side mm. into Ukrainian industry to provide things like engine parts, uh, systems and subsystems into Russian systems, uh, which they are no longer going to be able to enjoy. Uh, this, of course, is going to have a negative effect on the Ukrainian defense industry. Already, the Ukrainian defense industry is seeking 
other export markets for its defense materiel with the assumption that Russia will no longer be a customer. Russia, for its own part, has decided to, within the next two to five years, uh, ensure that it does not need any defense equipment from the Ukraine uh, in years upcoming, becoming more self-sufficient, uh, especially in these critical areas such as aircraft and marine engines. I was going to say, you know, to, to, to simplify even further, not only would Russia not want to go there anymore, Ukraine, Russia's got the money to go not quite where it wants, but, you know, it's got the money. It's got this absolute spending power, really. Uh, what was it, $720 billion over 10 years it, it, to upgrade its military? It can do this. Yes, yes. Uh, between the two, Russia certainly has the, the capability, the drive and the political will to ensure that its uh, reform efforts have been uh, continue to make great strides for turning around the Russian military from its low point uh, about 15 years ago. Uh, the difficulty for Russia is uh, not so much the, the amount of investment that Russia can do, it's actually the uh, sort of skill set, the, the workers and skills uh, that are critical to maintain these industries. Uh, there have been reports that uh, Russia is seeking to uh, poach a lot of uh, uh, employees from uh, former Ukrainian uh, defense uh, combines in order to help bolster its own capabilities as far as manufacturing, expertise, and engineering, uh, which is, is hard to constitute in a very short time frame, as you might imagine. So what then, if anything, can the West do about any of this? You can't stop another country from arming itself. But the fear is obviously that these weapons are falling into the hands of separatists. Well, actually not even falling into the hands, they are being supplied to separatists. And the end result in this case was that a passenger jet got shot down. Well, obviously, it, depending on the amount of Russian involvement or, or, or speculation on, on such, uh, it would behoove Russia not to uh, allow separatists to use more advanced kit as that would constitute a bit more of a smoking gun uh, as far as you know, the direct links of, of supply. Uh, I think in this case you'll, you'll only see the separatists operating with kit that is found uh, in Russian inventories and Ukrainian inventories to uh, maintain the ambiguity about sort of the origins of these weapons. Uh, so I, I wouldn't anticipate that you would uh, see separatists with the most advanced uh, systems out there. Mm. Uh, they'll, they'll probably continue to use uh, things that are found within the Ukrainian inventory. But as we've seen, that, uh, that particular kit is still quite effective in doing what it's doing and, and is uh, enough to stymie uh, some of the Ukrainian advances, at least for the near term. Just a quick bit of um, geography, Reid. Where else can Russia go? to look for its, its weapons and its hardware. France is a country I've heard about, certainly with regard to uh, naval ships. Where else can it go? Well, Russia is, is very much interested in not looking uh, outwardly for its uh, requirements for its defense equipment. It, it, it is uh, very much seeking to become uh, independent and a defense uh, exporter to a great degree. Mm. Uh, I think we've seen a trend in recent years actually away from importing uh, other defense material into Russia itself uh, and the Russian political uh, mechanism is such they they're encouraging uh, Russian factories to become more advanced to produce more advanced weaponry and more advanced capabilities uh, within Russian borders so they don't have to depend on uh, third parties such as uh, Ukraine in this in this instance um, but it's, it's its share of the defense market uh, has maintained throughout the years and has grown uh, in several aspects uh, it remains one of the top defense exporters uh, in the world uh, and will probably retain that position for, for quite some time to come uh, just due to the relatively advanced nature of a lot of its hardware and the low cost nature of, of some of its hardware as well when compared with uh, some of the Western systems. Uh, final thought then, Reid, and this is really to, to, to widen things out. Do we potentially have a um, proliferation sure. problem? in this part of the world. You know, the, the book missiles, as I believe they're called, they were sold onto Syria in one case, which we talked about for a billion, dollar, billion dollars. Have we got a, a problem here where all this hardware is generated from one area, it moves around the region, it moves beyond the region, and then possibly falls into the wrong hands beyond Russia and Ukraine? Obviously, uh, this equipment uh, tends to sort of have a trickle-down effect to other countries. And as more advanced systems become available, uh, slightly less advanced systems are typically passed on uh, further down uh, to countries that uh, are trying to get new capabilities. Uh, the proliferation is, is rare, especially when you have uh, state-based actors losing bases or territories to non-state-based actors. 
as you've seen in, in northern Iraq or, mm -hmm. or in Ukraine in this uh, most recent case. Uh, I, I, I think that with the significance of this, uh, uh, the strategic impact that some of this equipment can have, I think there'll be increasing concerns in the world community about uh, proliferation and, and where this m more advanced weapons technology is ending up. Reid Foster, great to talk to you about uh, Russia this week here on Counting the Cost. Thank you for your time. And still ahead on Counting the Cost, the hunt for gold in Sudan, but the threat it also poses to the country's rich history. That story's coming up a little later. Uh, we're going to get all legal on counter the cost right now. Actually, two court cases that have been rattling around the legal system for almost a decade now. In New York, Argentina was facing off against vulture funds, while in the Netherlands, an international court of arbitration ordered Russia to pay up more than $50 billion. It would go to shareholders of the now defunct oil giant Yukos, Russia's biggest oil company, which was seized from former tycoon Mikhail Khodorkovsky in a Kremlin crackdown. Rory Challens has more from Moscow. The shareholders wanted $114 billion. The court awarded them under half that. Still a vast sum of money, though, and the director of GML, the holding company for Yukos's shareholders, says extracting this from Russia could get acrimonious. Russia played a full part in the arbitration, and, and we would expect them to, uh, uh, f having exhausted the, the uh, legal remedies that they have, if, if, if and when they fail, then, then to pay their liability as, as ordered by the tribunal and confirmed by the court. The story of how things got here involves the man who was formerly Russia's most high-profile prisoner. Mikhail Khodorkovsky was one of Russia's infamous oligarchs, businessmen who wrestled vast fortunes and power from the wreckage of the Soviet Union. His oil company, Yukos, became one of Russia's biggest energy firms. But when Vladimir Putin warned the oligarchs to stop meddling in politics, Khodorkovsky didn't listen. In 2003, he was arrested and spent more than 10 years in jail for tax evasion and fraud. Yukos was dismantled, with many of its assets ending up in the hands of state-run oil companies. It's that destruction that the court ruled against, saying essentially that Russia expropriated the shareholders' investments. To many observers in the West, the Yukos trail leads to just one place – the Kremlin and the strong-arm tactics of the quasi-dictator inside. But Russians, well, they see something slightly different. A group of robber barons who came up against a stronger force and perhaps got what they deserved. There are no good guys here. It's interesting that in the Western media, Khodorkovsky was portrayed pretty negatively until 2003, when he had this quarrel with Putin. Uh, in 2003, miraculously, he became uh, an almost spotless businessman, persecuted by the Kremlin and challenging Putin alone in a very sort of cavalier fashion. And certainly this is not the story that the majority of Russians buy. Mikhail Khodorkovsky actually has had nothing to do with the case. He gave up all his shares nearly a decade ago as the legal noose tightened around him. But he's expressed satisfaction with the court's decision. Russia's government feels differently. It said it will appeal. The Yukos saga certainly isn't over yet. And now Argentina, which has defaulted on its debt for the second time in 13 years. It's worth remembering Argentina was happy to pay restructured debt holders but was blocked by a U.S. court. The judge insisted Argentina compensate the so-called vulture funds who refused to have their bonds restructured after the last default. That was back in 2001 on debt worth $95 billion. After years of talks, 93% of bondholders exchanged that debt for, well, more debt as it happens. But a small group of hedge funds who hold debt worth $1.5 billion want all their money back. If Argentina was to pay the funds back in full, it would need to find as much as $20 billion and would also need to offer the same terms to those who did restructure their debt. And here's the final catch. Argentina's only got $29 billion in the bank. Those are the levels of its currency reserves at the moment. But this goes beyond debt and creditors. For a country that's already in recession, the default could cut another 1% off growth. Throw in inflation, which is expected to hit around 40%, unemployment, which is at 7.1%. It is not the rosiest of pictures, is it? Daniel Schweimler has more from Buenos Aires. 
The dispute, the court cases, the waiting, all stem from 2001 when Argentina defaulted on debts of more than $100 billion. Many lost everything, while the country lived through years of economic and social turmoil. Subsequent governments reached agreement with most of their creditors to pay them some of what they were owed, those creditors believing that something was better than nothing. A few held out for the full amount. Engineer Horacio Vasquez is one of them. If my country takes 13, 14 years to give me what's mine, with everything that I've lost, I didn't send my kids to the college they want. I couldn't give my parents the health care they deserve. Who's to blame, me or the country? Argentine government supporters have dubbed Mr. Vasquez a little vulture. The big vultures, they say, are the U.S. hedge funds which bought up debt, then fought in the U.S. courts for full payment. This year they won when those courts ruled in favor of all the so-called holdouts. We had to make our claim in the United States, but we were lucky we could go to the U.S., because here we couldn't do anything. The Argentine president, Cristina Fernández de Kirchner, says her government is honoring its debts to those it's done deals with, but that it can't afford to pay those holding out for the full amount. The judge warned Argentina not to risk default, saying real people, not vultures, would be hurt. So, Yukos and Argentina, let's talk about both these legal cases with Kawa Qureshi QC. He's an international arbitration expert, the head of the McNair Chambers, joining us from our London studios. I want to start with uh, Yukos, Kawa. Uh, this is going back a long time. It is a long time ago that Yukos went under. How long, or, or, you know, how long more uh, before people start to see their money? Because Russia wants to appeal, I believe. Well, the uh, situation all arises out of what started off as a tax demand but the tribunal sitting in The Hague has determined led to the expropriation of assets, the Russian authorities using the tax demand as a pretext to take over Yukos's vital and uh, valuable uh, assets in the oil sector. How long will it take? The Russian authorities have a very limited period of time to appeal to the Dutch courts, and the appeal is on a very, very narrow basis. They will have to satisfy the Dutch court that the arbitrators got it very badly wrong as a matter of law or there was some serious procedural impropriety. We have to see what the potential grounds of appeal are likely to be but the appeal process ordinarily when it's a challenge of an arbitration award in jurisdictions such as England and Wales or the Netherlands doesn't take very long. So perhaps another year, year and a half at most if an appeal is pursued and thereafter of course Russia's commercial assets, wherever they may be in the, in the world, are exposed to enforcement measures and execution measures. I want to move on to uh, Argentina. Bring us up to date with where we are there because the country has defaulted again. Uh, talks are ongoing. Could we still see some sort of deal cut in Argentina? What we have in the Argentinian situation is a deadline imposed by the US court for Argentina to be able to negotiate with the, the group that holds 7% of the bonds uh, that were acquired on the secondary market for less than the face value, uh, the group that wants the full face value of the bonds in comparison with the 93% that agreed a lower amount uh, by way of settlement from Argentina. The situation is that Argentina owes this group called the holdout group uh, $1.3 billion. Uh, the crisis is not of the magnitude that took place in 2001. And it's quite possible that this is an as aspect of negotiation tactic on the part of Argentina. Put in a position where, uh, where the American courts uh, have imposed a strict deadline, there's not much room for maneuver for Argentina in terms of negotiation. There was a mediation that broke down, but one would expect there to be further negotiation. and. In this kind of situation, a settlement eventually to uh, be produced. And we've got, Koal, what you call, or whatever you want to call them, the, the holdout funds, some people say, or the vulture funds, uh, who this judge has said needs to be paid in full. Now, there's been some criticism that he's not fully understood the implications of this. Can you give us a basic sort of understanding of that? Because it seems this handful of other creditors could actually end up disrupting a whole lot of other things. You know, it is 
it is bigger than just these holdout funds, even though they, those are the ones which, which grab all the headlines. Well, you've got two competing interests here. You've got strict contract law, and strict contract law stipulates that if you enter into a contract to do X, well, you're obliged to do X. And if you don't do X, the party that you owe that obligation to could either seek to enforce that obligation or agree a compromise. The holdouts, the 7%, bought the, the rights to make a full claim uh, on the, what I described as the secondary market. So at a contractual level, they're fully entitled to seek the face value of the bonds by way of payment. The, that's the, the first interest contract. The second interest is the greater public interest or the interest of a state such as Argentina, which is borrowing significant amounts, as are many developing states, and the potential for the position of the holdouts to disrupt the settlement with the 93%, as well as to undermine the economic stability of Argentina. The judge in this situation, as he has to, can only look at the contract. And if the contract requires Argentina p to pay the face value, arguments about the holdouts, their nature, their so-called vulture fund nature, the go around buying assets on the cheap and then enforcing them uh, using as many methods and, and as aggressively as possible in uh, courts all over the world. Those are arguments that might well have some significance in the international arena and it may be that a body such as the World Bank or the IMF has to regulate this. There may be a need for a treaty to deal with debts of states and how those debts can be bought and sold and how they can be enforced. But that's not, on, that's not certainly being discussed at the moment. Thank you, Kawa Qureshi QC, joining us from London this week. Finally this week, Sudan. When we talk about the country or its southern neighbour on this programme, we're usually talking oil. This time, though, another resource, gold. Sudan actually has a long history with the yellow metal, but as Bernard Smith tells us now, that history is being threatened by a modern-day gold rush. In northern Sudan, the imposing remains of the ancient kingdom of Kush are scattered across the desert. What helped sustain that empire were the rich gold fields here. Okay. Now a new gold rush is threatening to destroy what evidence remains of the Kushites. In mo most cases, they are just throwing them away. They so don't understand what they it don't is. Understand them. These are some of the artifacts seized from gold prospectors who've unearthed them as they dig. Implements and jewellery more than 3,000 years old. You want really to control this, all this and to be supervising all kind of activities in such area, such very interesting area for us, because uh, all these places, we call them the Eastern Desert. It's the area between the Nile and the Red Sea. And, uh, we believe in ancient history that this area was like a crossroad. A million Sudanese are involved in traditional mining, producing more than 90% of the country's gold. It's a vital source of revenue for the government, but the prospectors are digging where the Kushites once dug, hacking through ancient history. More than 3,000 years ago, the Kushites ruled from Palestine up in the north through Egypt down to here in what was Nubia. They copied the idea for the pyramids from the pharaohs. There is so much of this kingdom yet to be discovered, but Sudan's underfunded archaeologists can't keep up with the rush for gold. There is also concern that many Sudanese don't appreciate their past. I guarantee in a few years we will lose many sites because in our experience where when we are inspecting the sites we see the like gold miners they are were there and for sure they will come again the government in Qatar has donated more than 120 million dollars to renovate the national museum and fund a series of digs the ministry of mining admits there are major problems and it told al jazeera that it hasn't developed the regulations needed to control traditional mining. The ministry says it needs international advice on how to manage the gold rush so that Sudan's heritage is protected. And that right there is our show for this week. More for you online though at aljazeera.com slash programs. Individual reports and links to keep you across all our stories and a feed of social media comments as well as there down the right hand side. Very easy for you to join that. Uh, you can tweet either me at Kamal A-G-E 
our business editor at Abed Oliver Ali, and there's the hashtag counting the cost as well, or just drop us an old fashioned email. Counting the cost at aljazeera.net is the address. That's it though for this edition of Counting the Cost. I'm Kamal Santa Maria from the whole team. Thanks for joining us. The news on Al Jazeera is next.